Has this ever happened to you? You go into a shoe store looking for the best running shoe. You are greeted by a friendly staff member who assesses your foot shape, arch height, and walking patterns over a pressure sensor. Based on their analysis, they allocate a certain type of shoe. Sounds like excellent service, but is this process accurate? Allow me to answer this question and provide you with a simple step-by-step -step guide to finding your best running shoe. And at the end of this video, I'll be covering a confusing shoe characteristic known as the heel drop. This spec is important when selecting a shoe and once you know more about it, you'll be walking into the next shoe store with confidence. Let's start off with the most common types of shoes. Firstly, we have a motion control or stability shoe. These have added support built into the shoe to help guide the foot and ankle in a certain direction. Most commonly, there will be a firm support built up underneath the arch of the foot, seemingly to restrict excessive rolling in of the foot, referred to as pronation. Compare this to our second type of shoe, which is a neutral shoe, and my very dirty shoes. Now, neutral shoes don't have the same supporting structures. Instead, it allows for the foot and ankle to naturally move in whatever direction it wants. Even though neutral shoes allow you to move freely into pronation, it will still commonly have some rigidity throughout the entire length of the shoe. This is unlike our third and final type of shoe, which is the barefoot or minimalist shoe. Now these shoes offer very little support, leaving the foot and ankle to absorb a lot of the force when making contact with the ground. But Brody, how do I know what shoe is best for me? Good question because this is where a lot of misconceptions and frankly marketing ploys start to creep in. Allow me to explain. Remember at the start of this video when I went through that common experience in the shoe store? For example, a staff might find you have flat feet and say that you over pronate. Therefore, you will need to have a stability shoe in order to control the seemingly unwanted movement of pronation. Well, it's not that simple. In fact, research fails to find a correlation between foot shape and shoe type. Take this paper from Nielsen and colleagues who grouped 927 runners into five foot types and had them all run in neutral shoes. After a year of running in these shoes, the researchers analyzed the data to see which foot type was injured the most. Surprisingly, they couldn't find any significant difference in injury rates between groups. In fact, if you're not surprised enough, the paper revealed that pronators had a significantly lower number of injuries per thousand kilometers of running than neutrals. What? If we're going off the theory established by shoe stores, this is the opposite result of what we would expect. So Brody, what is going on here? And what should we do if there's no link with foot shape and shoe type? allow me to introduce a theory proposed by running professionals called the comfort filter. This is a process that requires you to try a bunch of different shoes, hopefully running in them as well, and pick a pair that is the most comfortable. The comfort filter speculates that everyone has a different preferred movement path. And if a shoe facilitates in this movement path, it would be more comfortable. If it restricts or alters your natural path, it will be uncomfortable. Do not buy into someone saying that pronation is bad. No matter what the degree of pronation, you've been moving that way your whole entire life and your body will be used to it. In fact, pronation is a necessary protective mechanism as it helps to absorb the ground reaction force in a slightly longer period of time. So let me just run a little experiment. I'm going to hit this table with a flat hand and just feel the amount of force that goes through that compared to me trying to hit the table at the same rate but with a roll I can tell you now with the flat hand it was a lot more painful and this is probably why the paper mentioned before had pronators injured less it's a protective mechanism so here are three steps you need to take to find the perfect shoe but if you have already found your perfect running shoe help another runner out who is watching this video by sharing the type of shoe and why you love it so much you can do that in the comments section below. Okay, step one is an obvious one, and it is to find the right shoe size. Leave some wiggle room for your toes at the end of the shoe to avoid some bruised toenails and to allow for a minor foot swelling when you start running longer distances. Step two is to find the right shoe width. The most common width sizes are 2A, B, D, 2E, and 4E. 
They're pretty random, but that's what they have. A standard width for men is D, and a standard for women is B. When you put a shoe on, the ankle should feel secure, and your toes should be able to splay out within the toe box. Try on different shoes with different widths and select the most comfortable. For example, if you're a woman and find the standard is too narrow, you might want to find a shoe that says women's wide, or you could even do the exact same thing and try on a men's standard. Once you've found a comfortable size and width, step number three is to try on a neutral shoe and compare this to a stability shoe. Walk and jog in these to find what is most comfortable. Now, before I talk about the importance of the heel drop, I thought it would be important to talk about a fourth step. After you've filtered down all your choices, the next is to pick a shoe that looks the best. Go ahead and pick whatever design, color, fabric that excites you and you want to show off next time you hit the track. This simple step-by-step -step guide will help you pick the best shoe for you. And while there are several other features that experienced runners may prefer, I thought I would highlight what I feel is the most important and that is the heel drop. This measurement will often be in millimeters and is the difference between the heel height and the midfoot height. For example, when I wear this shoe, my heel is 20 millimeters off the ground and my midfoot is only 12 millimeters off the ground. This would mean that the difference and therefore the heel drop will be eight millimeters. This can be important not only to hone in on what you find the most comfortable, remember we're still following that comfort filter, but can also have useful implications redirecting load throughout the body. Put very simply, the higher heel drop, say above eight millimeters, will give your feet, your calf, and your Achilles some reprieve. While this sounds desirable, keep in mind that the load itself just shifts, it shifts upwards towards the knees and the hips. The opposite effect will occur if the heel drop is less than five millimeters. Your calf, Achilles, and feet will put in a little extra work and usually take some of the pressure away from your knees and hips. So based on your strength and your injury history, you may want to redirect the running loads to more favorable areas that you can better handle. For example, if you had a long history of Achilles pain, a 10 millimeter drop might be more desirable than say a zero millimeter drop. You now have a clear understanding of the perfect running shoe for you. But once you put these on and hit your favorite running path, it'd be useful to know some insight into running techniques. Well, I've created an entire video based on this topic and you can go check that out now.